All right, we're live for the 130th installment. Let's rock and roll. Talking about minimizing risk when raising kids, and this is gonna tie into what we talked about last week with maintaining GBD in a long-term relationship. Um, so if you didn't see that episode, go back to last week's 129 after watching this one for a little more context on keeping her interested in you on a long term because the threat is real. Um, we've talked before many times about the issues with uh, getting married, kids, and um, everything that happens with that ecosystem. How's my volume, by the way? Am I coming in loud and clear? Um, and it's a risky proposition in the West. And when I say the West, I'm talking Canada, United States, England, Scotland, Ireland, Australia, like any Western developed English speaking country has very, very similar laws when it comes to um, how knots are tied and how knots are untied, getting married and getting you know divorced. And generally speaking, most women will demand a living situation or a marriage as part of having kids. Um, there are places in the world that it's a little bit more common where people don't get married anymore. Um, they're more egalitarian. Uh, I know the province of Quebec and Canada, uh, a lot of people have kids and they don't get married. Um, but there's lots of things to talk about in the show, which will enlighten those that are always asking the question. Somebody asked during my um, 700K uh, Q&A on the Entrepreneurs and Cars channel, uh, to talk in detail about raising kids and reducing the risk. So I thought I'd dedicate it on the Unplugged Alpha, um, you know, get into a little more deeper, dive into the weeds sort of thing. So if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe, hit the like, do all the good stuff. And uh, apologies for the main camera not working. It's still down. It doesn't focus for some reason. Spend seven Gs on lens and a body and freaking thing doesn't cooperate. I'm resorting to the uh, webcam for this show. So that's why you're getting this angle. Hopefully we can get it fixed for the next show. Um, all right, let's get started. Let's get started on this rabbit hole of insanity. The amount of work that you're gonna have to do to minimize the risk, it is not low. I'll start by saying that. It is not low. It is a amount of work which I think, if, you know, if I'm being honest, most guys will probably avoid, but you've asked for a video on this topic, so I'm giving it to you. You ask, you shall receive. Uh, okay, let me share a infographic that I put together months ago. Uh, here we go. Let's see if this pops up on the screen. Is that big enough for you guys to read? Hang on, let me see if I can enlarge it for the full screen here. Um, good enough? Seems that way anyway. Pull it out a little bit more this way. Let's see if we can get larger. Nah, it doesn't do much. Okay, we'll go with that. We'll say that that works. So there's four quadrants that every dude will fall into. We'll start by saying that, okay? Um, there's uh, your, so on the left-hand side, you've got the top shelf guys, the alpha sort of characters. On the right-hand side, you've got the betas. On the top of the quadrants, you've got uh, your unplugged characters. And on the bottom, you've got the plugged-in characters. So bottom left over here, as you can see my cursor on the screen, you can have a plugged in alpha, you can have an unplugged alpha, you can have an unplugged beta, you can also have a plugged in beta. Uh, the arrows that you see that I've illustrated here are the movement that most people sort of move uh, to and from, all right? So the vast majority of guys you'll see will move from the plugged in beta category to the unplugged beta. Very few will go over to the unplugged alpha category. This is the top 5% of men. Oh, why did it do that? Come on, cooperate. We'll go like this. This is the top 5% of men here. No. For real? Okay. You know what I'll do? I'll just zoom it in this way and I'll slide it over. That way you'll get the same effect. Or we'll go with that, whatever. So the top 5% of men, you get some naturals in there. Uh, but most will arrive there through work. Some sort of belief that they had uh, in relationships, women, whatever it is you want to break it down to, um, force them to deal with some issues in their life that come to resolutions. So the bullet points here, they might be harder for you guys to read on the screen. I'll just read them out. Um, so top 5% of guys live mental point of origin, chase excellence, not women. 
Men want to be them. Women want to be with them. They have a look. They signal status and have pre-selection. Pre-selection just means that um, they're just known for who they are. You know, you can walk into a room and they establish who they are by the way they care, carry themselves. Um, their reputation precedes them, that sort of stuff. They're significant and excellent problem solvers. I think being a problem solver is one of the most important skills to develop if you're going to be an entrepreneur or if you're going to be a successful guy in life with options. Being able to spot and adapt and deal with problems is incredibly important. They've also achieved the 1.62 golden ratio, which signals the strength and masculinity, incredibly important for the optics of attraction. Broad shoulders, narrow waist. A lot of dudes will, you know, talk to me on these shows. They'll call in, uh, you know, they'll send me DMs and I'll look at their social and it's like, dude, you're fat. You've got to deal with the belly fat. You got to deal with, like, just go to the gym. It's Get a gym membership. They're not expensive. Pick up heavy shit, put it down. Even if you don't have the means for a personal trainer, just there's lots of free information on the internet, which clarifies <clears throat> and establishes what you need to do to build a strong masculine frame. The golden ratio is what is uh, the standout attraction cue for high value men universally around the world. I'll keep moving on. Uh, they're outcome independent results. Sorry, they're outcome independent to results, so they don't really care. Uh, you know, they look for the best results. If they get the bad results, fine, we'll deal with it. It's not the end of the world. Uh, they generally are or are becoming anti fragile. The anti fragile guy uh, improves when chaos hits him in life. I've talked about the notion of fragility and anti fragility before. There's a book called Anti Fragile. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to check it out. To summarize it, there's three distinct categories. There's uh, fragility, there's uh, robustness, and um, there's anti-fragile. Uh, fragility, obviously, something will break when chaos is added to it. So you can drop something, gravity. Uh, you know, you could have a piece of glass like this uh, water bottle that I've got. Put it in a box, drop it, it'll probably smash. That's, you know, it's a fragile item. A robust item, nothing will happen to it. It doesn't matter what happens when chaos hits a robust item. It doesn't get worse, it doesn't get better, it doesn't break, it doesn't improve. An anti-fragile uh, individual improves when chaos is added to their lives. Uh, an example would be uh, what happened during the scamdemic when people were either forced to do certain things that they didn't agree with uh, so a lot of them, the vast majority of them ended up having to comply. There was a small contingent of people out there uh, that didn't. And they also found ways to improve their uh, status in the world during that uh, period of chaos, if I can put it that way. Um, so we talked about the improvement of fragility. Uh, they generally have accumulated or are accumulating seven figure plus wealth. They only allow women in their life if they're a compliment, not the focus. They spot problem women fast and they remove them. And don't worry about all this, guys. This will end up um, in the next book. I have uh, the School of Unplugging, which is coming soon. All of this will be broken down in detail. Uh, I'll probably send this out to my email list at some point, too, to sort of break it down for you a little bit more there in detail. So you, if you want to screen capture it, cool. doesn't matter. Um, we talked about women. Uh, will never be the smartest person in the room. They understand that a network is their net worth. So they go out of their way to put themselves in better rooms. If they find themselves to be in a room where they're the smarter, smartest guy in the room, they get out of that room, they put themselves in a better room. They surround themselves with winners and they remove losers very quickly. So this is the first top quadrant of the Unplugged Alpha. This is where you want to be as a guy. And I think it's relevant to the notion of having kids because... When it goes back to maintaining genuine burden and desire and having a woman in your frame and being strongly attracted to you, um, you've got to be that top shelf man that you know women want to be with. You understand? Cool. All right. Um, let's go to plugged in alpha. So these guys are like the natural chats. Um, here, I'm gonna let's just kind of zoom in on these categories as we cover them. These guys over here are the natural chats. They've got many of the qualities of the unplugged alpha above, but the biggest difference is they're still plugged into society's lies, right? Such as things like chore play. Like if I do enough chores, you know, she'll love me strongly. Happy wife, happy life. I've sat in rooms with weapons, guys that run eight-figure businesses. Uh, they start them from the ground up, but they're still the same dorks that will sit there and be like, well, happy wife, happy life. And, you know, as long as I keep Becky happy, everything will be fine, okay? So you can be 
viewed by the world as a strong, virtuous alpha male, but also be plugged into lies. Uh, they will still negotiate desire. They will believe the mainstream media when they say things, right? Like, go and take this thing. It's totally safe and effective. Sure, how did that work out? Uh, they pedestalize women and they vote for things like big government. Again, uh, these same rooms that I've been in where you've got these weapons running eight-figure businesses, I've sat across the table from these guys and, and some of them are like all about UBI, universal basic income, uh, large distributions and transfers of wealth from extremely wealthy people to uh, people that haven't uh, accumulated the wealth or done the work in their life. Um, so you can be a situational alpha, again, do very well in life, be very uh, wealthy, be extremely healthy, have the 1.62 golden ratio, but still do dumb shit, right? Um, they'll tolerate problem women in their life. That's another key uh, factor of, of the plugged in alphas. Uh, they'll complicate their life, justify why they do it. They're generally pretty easy to unplug though, which is a plus because all they need is a little bit of chaos and then you start showing them some of the code in the matrix as we like to say, and then they sort of move up to this category over here and they unplug. They maintain the same status, same wealth, same physical attributes and qualities and virtues. They just stop sitting around going, well, happy life, happy, or sorry, happy wife, happy life, dorky stuff like this. They're often nice guys too. Nice guys, if you're unfamiliar, like to, like to create these covert contracts in their head where it's like they'll go and buy the house that she wants in a neighborhood that she wants, move her parents there that she likes, renovate the kitchen the way that she likes. Like nice guys will create these covert contracts and think if I just do a nice, enough nice things for her, then she'll be with me in a perpetuity and never leave me or cheat on me you know, with a pool guy. Um, you can read No More Mr. Nice Guy if you want to learn more about the nice guy uh, sort of avatar. Let's keep moving on because we've got a lot to cover during the show. So let's go to, um, well, here, let's go to the plugged in betas first. So this is about the bottom 80% of men. This is the vast majority of guys out there. These are the guys that mostly get wrecked in family law that has have their kids removed from them. They're alienated from their children. Um, they have a very hard time operating. These are the same guys that fall into the category where they self-delete themselves if things aren't going well in their life because uh, they don't have anything else to live for. So these are the blissful ignorance uh, fellows. They bend the knee to women and societal narratives. They put women on a pedestal, life and social media. They chase women relentlessly, not excellence, right? Like these are the guys that you'll see uh, comment on Reddit posts or on social media. And they'll be saying shit like, you know, I got a good job. I make $47,000 a year. Um, I have my own Tesla. Uh, I'm a really good guy and women just don't like me. I don't understand why. Like these are the same guys that'll, that'll, that'll blow up Reddit with these posts. A lot of them you'll see me share on uh, Twitter and, uh, it's always the same sort of, you know, guy plugged into lies, right? Like there was a guy that I shared the other day was talking about being upset that dating is so performative. Like you have to perform and compete. And it's like, dude, men compete, women choose. It's always been that way. It's always going to be that way. Sitting around and sulking or whining about it and being a plugged in beta is not going to solve any of those problems for you. Again, all of these quadrants over here that I'm covering for you are of significance and relevance because I'm talking about your part first. We're gonna do your part, her part, the setup to having the kids and then the execution, which is once the kids come along in this video. So again, this is the you part, okay? You do not wanna be in this cat. This is the worst category for any guy to be in if they're thinking about having kids. If you're in this category right now, recognize it and then do the work to level up to move into one of the top categories. Uh, these guys will try to negotiate desire. They'll use things like chore play, like, honey, if I just do enough chores, will you bang me and give me starfish sex? They're insignificant, generally invisible to most women. Um, it's very, very hard for these guys to get the attention of the women that they're attracted to. Um, again, I've mentioned this on many shows before, but it's very, very typical and common for guys in this uh, category uh, they'll get a date, they'll get a girl, they'll start dating her, they might become exclusive. You know, it's usually the first girl that touches their pee pee that they fall head over heels in love with, and they just start putting her up on a pedestal and very, very quickly go through betatization through a thousand concessions and turn her off. You do that, you're screwed. She's, she's going to take your kids and run. You know, she's going to look at you as a guy that she might have seen as uh, adequate at that time, uh, handsome enough to 
be with or to reproduce with, but changes her mind later on down the road when she sees um, that you're not the guy that she wanted to be with on a long-term basis. These guys are physically out of shape. Guys, there's no reason for you to be physically out of shape, none whatsoever. If you get out of the shower and you look down, you can't see your Johnson because there's belly fat covering it, or if you've got female breast tissue when you're running down the stairs and they're jiggling, you're out of shape. It, you, you just can't be in that. Sp there's no woman out there that pine for men with de dad bods. That is a bullshit lie that the mainstream media has been selling to you for decades now where they're telling you, oh, women like a guy with a dad, that's bullshit. There's absolutely no dating site out there where women uh, can select from fat dudes, from, you know, there's no chubby chasing sites where women select guys that are physically out of shape. If you're shaped like a pear, you gotta fix it, okay? Um, it's not, you know, to be a, a better parent, it's not for her to keep her attracted. This is for you. All, a lot of this stuff that I talk about is for you, for you to be the leader, for you to get what you want out of life. This is for your physical health, okay? Physical health. Uh, let's keep going. They're fragile and they allow women to, to become problem in, problems in their lives. So we are talking earlier over here about the notion of fragility and anti-fragility and robustness. These guys are all fragile. Uh, these are the guys that will hop into shows to ask me questions or DM me during uh, chaotic times like when we had the scamdemic and then be like, Rich, you know, I work at this company, and if I don't take this uh, experimental uh, Jabba juice here, I'm, I'm going to lose my job. You know, what should I do? I got a mortgage. To, like, you're fragile at that point. You don't have options. Um, you don't have a way around it. You don't have a solution to a problem. And many people found solutions to that problem at that time, whether it was an exemption that they leveraged, whether it was... Um, through uh, like unions that they leverage, whether it was through the opportunity to move into another line of work or another company, they found ways to solve problems. Fragility is unattractive and it limits your ability to maneuver. Uh, again, you do not want to be fragile. Robustness is fine, not ideal, but anti-fragility, when chaos comes your way in your life, you, you benefit from it. Do you understand? Um, these are guys that complicate their life and they justify why they do it. Again, 80% of men fall in this category. The vast majority of guys, I see this shit all the time when people forward me these Reddit posts and I, you know, I post them to Twitter with my own commentary. These are the nice guys that complicate their life and justify why. They'll do the dumbest things, make the most silliest concessions, and then ask the most absolute absurd solution to problems that they're dealing with of people they don't even know, hoping to get good guidance. Complicate life, justify why. I made a bad choice. I'm going to justify why I made a bad choice, right? That's all that complicate life, justify why is. That's what plugged in betas do. They also believe the mainstream media. They vote for big government. They also vote for control. You notice similarities here, okay, between plugged in alphas and plugged in betas. They have very similar tra traits. The biggest difference is these guys are more of the naturals, the good looking chads. But they still do dumb, like dumb shit. Like they'll say, "Oh, universal basic income is a great idea. Let's vote for more big government. Happy wife, happy life." These guys will say it. These guys will say it. The difference is these guys are more attractive to women than these guys. Uh, they can be very successful leaders and entrepreneurs, aka useful puppets. So I've talked about weapons in this segment over here. Again, I've sat across tables that have been guys that have been running eight-figure businesses. They're chads. They're tall. They're good-looking handsome chisel jaw, that sort of stuff, but they still sit around, go happy wife, happy life. There's even more guys that are plugged in that can be weapons as well, running eight-figure businesses that are absolute nerds, okay? And they don't embody the strength, uh, courage, and virtues that we can talk about often when it comes to the alpha characteristics. Now, let's keep moving on. We're going to go over here to uh, the unplugged beta. This is where most of the movement happens, okay? The blissfully ignorant will hit chaos and then they unplug and then they sh and then they shift up to here which I call the danger zone. Again, this is the bottom 10 per 10% of guys, right? So the bottom 80% of men fit in this category, you get the other bottom 10% that are the unplugged betas and then the split of the fives, the 5% 5 over here in the unplugs uh, sorry, on the alpha side of the uh, equation. Uh, go back to the zoom in here. So, again, this is the danger zone. 
trauma brings these guys to the point of unplugging. Their girlfriend cheats on them. Their wife uh, wants to divorce them. They are betrayed in ways that they can't fathom. Women say something and then do something completely different uh, that brings trauma or chaos into their life. That's okay. Now they're unplugging. Now they're heading to the danger zone. I call this a danger zone because most guys stay in this zone. Right? They, they are generally mad and they stay mad when they unplug from the lies. They were lied to over here. They realize I've been lied to. They move up here. They're still betas, but now they've unplugged from the lies and they see the truth from the lies. But they often stay mad. They often stay in the zone. They don't level up and move into a better category. Many wallow in misery and stay at this point perpetually. They're very similar to plugged in betas, but now they see the truth. That's the only difference, okay? Very few of these guys will do the work to level up. They stay in a state of unplugged but beta. These are the guys that you'll see that'll congregate uh, in these whiny groups where they'll be like, you know, I was I was dealt a raw hand and I'm not good looking enough to get girls. Um, I was dealt a raw hand. My skin is the wrong color to get a girl. Um, I'm only using girls as a reference you know, point here because... Uh, that's one of the important metrics that we're going to talk about when it comes to finding mother stock, right? Um, they're, most are missing a fastidious, relentless pursuit of excellence. They don't have a purpose. They've unplugged. They see what society responds to. They see what men favor. They see what women are attracted to. But they don't have a relentless pursuit of excellence. They don't have a purpose in life. Many are the smartest people in the room. A lot of these unplugged betas, they'll unplug... They'll realize what's real. They'll realize what's lies, but they surround themselves with losers. It's like they're the king of the losers. I said over here earlier, um, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. This is what the unplugged alphas will do. They never allow themselves to remain the smartest person in the room. They understand a network, a good network is their net worth. These guys over here, they, they just surround themselves with nerds because they want to be king of the nerds, right? It's like crabs in the bucket. They can complicate life and justify why they do it, not to the same degree as these guys will because they're unplugged at this point, but they still, if they're, if they're not in shape, if they're still uh, lacking a grind or a purpose, that's what keeps them. That's why I call this a danger zone. It's a bad place to be. But they don't, they don't trust the mainstream media or the state. Okay? Understand? Cool. So that's the you part. It's really important for you if you want to get excellent result out of being a father because that's what this is about is how do you how do you become a father I see some super chats here guys I'm going to get to those uh I will I promise so just leave them in there I'll go to these questions in a bit um you have to level yourself up there's uh, there's no two ways about it you want to go and have a family you want to have children you want to try to do it as a fat dork try but the vast majority of women at some point will get bored with you they'll put you through betatization They'll run you through the grinder, the divorce grinder, and take a lot of your wealth and your resources and alienate you from your kids. It's, it's just how family law operates. Um, I've covered it in my book, The Unplugged Alpha, Why Smart Men Don't Marry Anymore. Um, there's lots of reasons for it. Guys in my category, in my age group, uh, generally don't get married when they're unplugged alphas, again. Um, are there circumstances that it might be warranted? Maybe. We'll talk about that in another show. Um, but they definitely get the best results out of life in the top quadrant, okay? Again, you can, you can slide back, do a, a screenshot if you want to take a look at it. I'll send that out to my email list at some point. You should get on my list. It's below over here, entrepreneursandcars.com forward slash red dash flags. Also visit my website at richcooper.ca for everything else. You want to book me for coaching, supplements, take a look at future events, all that stuff, it's there. Let's talk about her part now, okay? So... Your part's not as difficult, if we're being honest, as her part. Getting rid of body fat, develop, developing a strong masking and frame, understanding what works, doesn't work. Read The Unplugged Alpha over and over again. Read Evo Psych, the books that I've talked about. The Evolution of Desire by David Buss. Why Women Have Sex by David Buss. Uh, these are all very good established reads that will help you unplug from the lies. The alpha part is you obviously becoming confident, influential, having a good social network, uh, being masculine, virtuous, courageous, all those sorts of things. Got it? Good. Her part. First thing we're going to talk about is red flags. 21 of them. I'm not going to get into detail because I've covered the red, the red flags many, many times before. You can go back. I think 
I did a video on it in the last six weeks on this podcast channel, uh, detailing all of them. But you should avoid women with red flags. Um, I was watching a video that was in my feed the other day. What was it? Uh, Chris Williamson, Modern Wisdom or something like that. Um, he had this Matthew Hussey guy on. Uh, look, I understand that he's, that he's handsome, he's well-spoken, and he's got a great accent that women love, and he mostly panders to women. But the title of the video was something along the lines of red flags. And he's talking about women that don't, um, that aren't accountable. Or I think in general he might have said, you know, people that aren't held accountable. Uh, men can be held accountable. Men love to be held accountable. Strong, virtuous alpha males love to be held accountable and will do the work uh, and take ownership for stuff. Um, but I don't think that saying like, well, a woman that's holding herself accountable means that it's a green flag. Or if she doesn't hold herself accountable, that's a red flag. The vast majority of women aren't held accountable to any standard. And that's just a statement of fact. It's not disparaging. It's just a reality. Women very rarely are uh, going to be held accountable to anything. You can try to hold them accountable. We see these podcast shows. Um, I've even tried to do it, you know, with women that come on Ladies Night, you know, from time to time. But a lot of these podcast shows are like, let's hold women accountable and, um, you know, ensure that they understand these basic facts. And they just don't. They don't care. It doesn't matter to them. You know, if you tell a woman that, uh, you know, promiscuity is going to lower your uh, dating options, you know, your options to have a strong guy, uh, climbing the corporate ladder, uh, chasing a career is a bad idea. You know, you're going to miss your opportunity to have kids. They don't care because there's always some guy out there that's whispering in her ear or in her DMs or somewhere you're beautiful, you're wonderful, you can't do anything wrong. It's, it's, it's everywhere. So, you know, the notion of, of some of these red flags that I see on YouTube, horrible fucking advice, um, missing the main points, understand the 21 red flags, spot the 21 red flags, and vet for mother stock with the 21 red flags. Avoid women that exhibit a lot of red flags that I talk about in that chapter of my book. You don't have to buy the book. Again, you can get it for free below. Just opt into my email list and you can download it immediately. It's a PDF, okay? So that's the first thing. Look for red flags, vet for them. Um, if there's red flags on that list that can be worked on, that she's working on, and it's obvious to you that she's working on them, good, okay? Maybe she's worth entertaining as mother stock. You shouldn't stop spinning plates at that time. Um, it, you know, if, if she's indicated that she's chosen you, she's got a strong interest in you, she's got a genuine burning desire, but you point something out like, look, um, I can't take a woman seriously that has a shopping addiction. You're spending a lot of time buying uh, lamps, returning them, nightstands, ottomans, decorating your house, uh, hanging up curtains, taking them down. You put up one chandelier you don't like. You, like If you have an addiction to shopping, buying shit, and returning it, uh, that's not for me. That might be for some other guy. That's not a brutal red flag. Like You can't undo promiscuity. If she slept with 100 guys, you can't ever undo that. That's a huge red flag that'll never change. What you can do is you can draw a line in the sand and say, look, I don't take women seriously that have a shopping addiction, or I don't take women seriously that sit around for hours upon hours uh, on social media or watching shows like Bachelor or some shit like that, right? Like mindless garbage. Um, so those are lines in the sand that you can draw where you can delineate good from the bad. You know, you separate the wheat from the chaff. I'm not going to spend any more time on the red flags because I've covered it so many times. I think you guys should go back and watch that video that I did in the last uh, six or seven weeks. Let's talk about her family. If you're going to have kids with a woman, her family is going to matter. Do you get along with them? Are they aligned with you? Do you have similar opinions and views in all realms? Uh, Self-care and politics and uh, lifestyle choices and religion, if that's a thing for you. Do you have alignment with her family? Because it's not just you and her. It's you, her, and her entire uh, network, right? Um, some some guys sign up for some weird stuff where they'll get involved with a chick from a culture where it's like i don't know eastern europe russian philippines or you know something like that and all of a sudden you're not just with this girl but you're with her entire family and in some cases you're required to provide not just for her and your kids but for her entire family so understand what you're getting into a good two-year vetting period is still always advisable always two years it's not a huge amount of time for a 39 year old that's on a dating app that's all oh my eggs are drying up i need to get married now she's not going to wait for that and really why would you want to rush through something if you don't even know who the hell she is 
But if you're dealing with a chick that's like 24, 25, and you want to vet her for a few years for mother stock, she should have no issues waiting two to three years for you to see what she's made of. You're not going to tell her, I want to see what you're made of, but you're going to watch what she's all about. Barely know you, want to you know meet your family, want to learn more about you sort of thing. You want to watch how they behave when chaos is applied uh, to life or the relationship. Are they resilient to it? Do they break down and throw hissy fits? Again, a lot of this stuff I talk about in the red flags. What's her family like? Do you get along with her family? Do you get along with her brothers? Do you get along with her sisters? Do you get along with her dad? Does she have a good relationship with her dad? Is her mom kind, right? Um, or do you sit there and you watch the family bicker back and forth? Um, I remember I was dating this girl, I think I was 30 at the time, or maybe late 20s or something like that. And um, her parents had just moved back from somewhere in Asia. They were teaching her something. And they bought this new uh, kind of like a retirement bungalow. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching, and this was one of the first times that I met her mom. I'm watching her mom browbeat the shit out of her dad in front of me. She wasn't an attractive lady. That's another thing to look at too. If you want to know what your kid's mother's going to look like later on down the road, by the way, take a look at her mom because she's bound to look some, like some version of that. And she's browbeating the crap out of her dad, treating him like a utility, like an accessory, uh, like a handyman to all of her. It was like, you know, she wanted to say jump and she was expecting him to say how high, right? Watch the family. She will behave like a version of her parents. That is the model that women will use when they're going to operate in their own life, right? Really, really important, guys. I can't emphasize this enough. Spend some time with their family. See what they're made of. See what their alignment's like, what their political views are like, religious opinions are like what their monetary policies are like with money. All of this stuff's really, really important. If you can sit down with her old man and have a beer, a drink, whatever the hell, you know, for several hours and just shoot the shit and agree on a lot of stuff, pretty good. Same thing if she's got brothers and sisters, pretty good. Another really important thing that you might want to contemplate as well, uh, birth order. So let's talk about birth order. Birth order is really important. A lot of people overlook the significance of birth order when it comes to long-term pair bonding, especially for mother of kids. It's really important for mother of kids because you want a chick that's glued to you. You don't want a woman that's going to exercise the untying of the knot, leveraging of hostile family law to destroy you, alienating you from your kids. This is the costly shit that is problematic for men. This is the problem that men face. This is why we're doing this cast today because men face the very real reality very real reality. You can hear you can hear the severity of the problem here, the 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 significance of all of this, because family law encourages women to untie the knot and benefit from it financially by being the custodial caregiver to the kids. She has the kids. She gets more of the money. She gets more money monthly. Uh, there's many Western countries where women actually get more than half of what the matrimonial wealth happens to be. So. Birth order is significant because firstborns and lastborns statistically always do better, right? So I'm a firstborn. Um, I generally, if I'm going to date on a long-term basis or invite a chick in my life on a long-term basis, it's going to be on the notion that I'm a firstborn and she's a lastborn. Like firstborn, firstborns don't work. I tried it um, a few times. I've, I've dated a lot of professional uh, power women that have climbed the corporate ladder. I've mentioned before, my ex-wife was a lawyer. She was also a firstborn. That obviously didn't work out. Um, but again, I, I've dated a lot of these, like like the vast majority of pilots, CEOs, entrepreneurs, uh, high ticket sales uh, people, uh, professionals, doctors, lawyers. I can't, like The vast majority of people that get into these fields are all firstborns, okay? It's great for creating wealth. It's great for accomplishing things. Uh, but for long-term relationships and for mother stock, you want to you wanna match the best way that you possibly can. Firstborns do be best with lastborns. Middle children can get along with just about everyone. Um, so that's the benefit if you're a middle child. Only children, they can be a bit of a problem. If they're an only child, they can, they can throw a little bit of a hissy fit. It's, it's always about them. Uh, they were put up on a pedestal sort of growing up because they were the only kid. Um, so you can have some difficulties with only children, not, not that you can't have a relationship or have children with a woman like that, but just understand that what you get, you know, what you're getting into. 
Uh, what was the other uh, ratio? Oh, and last borns that have more than five years between them and the next oldest siblings take on the personality traits of a firstborn. So I could be firstborn. I could meet a girl. She says, you know, she's a lastborn. Oh, okay, cool. So what's the age, age difference between you and the next oldest sibling? 12 years. She's basically now a firstborn, right? She's got the personality traits. You can read a book on the subject. It's called, um, I think it's called The Birth Order Book. The author's name is Dr. Kevin Lehman. Really interesting read, fascinating. So go check that out. Uh, birth order does matter for that. We talked about alignment. Uh, you know, specifically if her family's aligned, she should also be aligned in the same areas as well too. Uh, that should be obvious. I shouldn't have to explain that. She should be aligned with um, just about everything. The vast majority of shit that you ever talk about. Politics, how you're going to raise kids. Are you going to homeschool them? You're going to put them in private school. You're going to put them in the public school system. What kind of extracurriculars are, you know, you know the kids going to do? Um, she, she has to be aligned with where you're going to live, whether it's uh, urban, rural, uh, you know, country, if you got to move anywhere. Uh, she has to be fully aligned with where things are going. And it's my estimation that it shouldn't be, you know, a sit down, deep negotiation. You're the man, lead. You're the one that wants to have the kids. You should be vetting for mother stock that is, that is going to follow, uh, the path that you've chosen. Um, uh, Men are responsible to uh, plot a course and find a way to get from A to B. Uh, women don't want to plot the course. They don't want to adjust the sails and you know do all that sort of shit. They just want to get on the boat and fucking suntan and take Instagram photos, right? Like it, for guys, it's your job to plot the course and then take her to the destination. Uh, I think that these that these people that often say things like, "Oh, you know, you got to be an equal partnership and you got to." agree on these things and negotiate all this sort of stuff. I remember um, I did a video on um, Jordan Peterson's breakdown of marriage. He had a three-part series on Daily Wire. It's on this channel, by the way, if you haven't watched that video. Go back in the catalog and find it. Um, the biggest flaws that I saw with his encouraging guys to just man up and get married, there was no vetting. There was nothing. like He, he would basically say, well, you want to sit down and negotiate everything right down to where the scissors go in the utility drawer. Like, I'm going to sit here and argue about where the scissors go in the utility drawer. This is, this is the advice that you're going to get from a lot of the trad cons, right? Take it for what it's worth. You know, if you, want, if you want that, go for that. I'm telling you, you know, from a statement of fact, from my experience and from the guys that I've coached, bad way to go about it. Go watch that video because I broke it down in extreme detail. Um... Let's talk about her part, you know, continuing on. So we've got a few more notes here. Purity matters. There's, there's guys that will push back on this. Um, I had a conversation with a polygynist, has six wives in Australia, Casey. I've mentioned this before. Uh, he's of the position that it doesn't really matter because all women go through a hoe phase. Um, and that he's, he's mentioned that he's found that women that were virgins when he got with them uh, often, no matter how good he is to them in all realms, whether it's in the bedroom or, uh, you know, in life in general, taking care of her, uh, will at some point step out because they haven't had any other experience. Funny argument that he made was something along the lines of, um, what did he say? Oh, if his D is so good, then this guy's D must be better. So let's go and explore. So that's one angle that I've heard. That's not been my experience and that's not what the data suggests. Um, the research that's been done on marriage and uh, men and women sticking together to raise kids over a long period of time is pretty clear. Um, women that have a large notch count and started accumulating notches younger in life. So let's use two examples. Um, Becky, who started accumulating notches at 14, and when you meet her in her late thir or, or in her late 20s or 30, let's just call it. She's accumulated a notch count into three or four figures, maybe, uh, is less desirable than a woman that started to accumulate notches at 23 and was only with two guys. Um, the data on this seems pretty clear. It, it, it's, it's obvious that, mar that marriages, if you're going to use marriage as a uh, yardstick, uh, are more prolonged and of higher quality when a woman hasn't been the village, village bicycle. Um, the percentage of your, 
your chance of having a divorce and her leaving, and women initiate them 70 to 80% of the time still, by the way. Women still get 70 to 80% of the custody orders. The vast majority of wealth flows from the father to the mother. Um, so if you're going to take on the risk of all this, I don't think that you want to do it with a chick that's got a large notch count. Um, the argument that makes the most sense to me is if you're going to have a disagreement and she's been with a hundred guys, um, what's going to stop her from saying, well, F this guy, I'll just go to one Oh one. Right. Uh, because she's conditioned. She's used to moving from guy to guy. There's not a lot holding her to the guy. So I think that purity matters. It's one of the things that I think that you should vet for. You're not going to get an honest answer. You're not going to be able to sit her down and be like, okay, so tell me how many guys have you been with sort of thing. You have to establish it through lifestyle. Um, was she with one guy for her entire 20s when you met her at 30? Okay. Uh, if that's the case, chances are it's probably just a very low notch count, like one or two. Okay. Uh, if, she's, if there's a total absence of a long-term relationship in her 20s, and she spent it traveling Europe, backpacking Asia, uh, through Australia, working on cruise ships, traveling around the country. You look at her social media, and every photograph is of her traveling to a different place, uh, sitting in front of a plate of food that she probably didn't pay for that looks rather expensive, on yachts, on private jets and exotic cars. She's been around a block. Um, you kind of establish it through lifestyle. Some guys will be like, oh, well, just ask her and then double or triple the number. Okay, fine. That's one way to do it. Um, the bottom line is her past matters to you because your future matters to her. Am I going to be able to preside and protect and provide? Good. I'm, I'm glad that you see that as valuable to you because it is valuable. Uh, but did you, and I want to know her past, did you run around? You know, did you, did you share your body with a lot of dudes? Um, because that's not desirable for a whole bunch of reasons. There's some really, really weird and disgusting things that have been researched and studied and proposed, um, which I'm not even going to get into. They've done fruit, fruit fly studies on this sort of stuff where it's like um, they found DNA uh, in the bodies of uh, the females that wasn't from the uh, uh, father or anybody else. It's just guys that she spent uh, time with. And again, the study hasn't been replicated in humans yet, but you see a lot of, uh, a lot of the guys on the interwebs using that argument to dissuade you obviously from that. And whether it's true or not, I don't know, but you know, there's a, a canary in the coal mine there. Uh, the other note that I have here is you want to stay away from the alpha widows. Um, if she has an attachment to a guy from her past, uh, Okay, so here's an interesting stat. Um, when they survey women in marriages, 50% of women in marriages admit to having a backup plan. Now, let's just paint a picture here. You're a woman, you're married, you've taken vows, you have, you have his children now. Why do you have a backup plan? Why would you admit to having a backup plan? It's an interesting question because 50% of women admit to having a backup plan. Having a backup plan is duplicitous. It's deceitful. Uh, the guys generally don't know that she has a backup plan. She's generally not exercising a backup plan. The backup plan is usually an ex-boyfriend, uh, a friend, a work husband maybe. Um, what else do they call? Even gay guys sometimes too. You know, they'll be like, uh, like, like there's a lot of dudes that will use what's called sneaky fucker game to sort of like uh, get into a woman's orbit. And there's any number of ways to do it. They can play the friend zone. They can do any number of things. This is very common uh, through much of the animal kingdom, actually. There's a lot of sneaky fucker game out there uh, where like males will sort of sneak into the female sort of zone. And usually they pretend to be a female or they'll disguise themselves somehow. Very, very interesting stuff when you get into the animal kingdom and, and how... Uh, you know, this deception sort of works. I think it's covered in uh, The Evolution of Desire by uh, David Buss. So you can lear learn more about it there. But you don't want her having a backup plan. You don't want her having a connection to any guys from her past, especially guys that she pined for, that she failed to lock down. The definition of an alpha widow is a guy that uh, she was either with or wanted in her past, but was unable to secure him 
um, and he got away. And she constantly holds a uh, place in her head and her heart for this guy. Um, how is she going to be committed to you and raising your kids if she's an alpha widow? You understand, right? Uh, the chances of her being an alpha widow are going to be higher if she's been with more guys, right? That's one of the reasons why I think purity is important. Um, it's one of the reasons why throughout history it was so important. And for some reason today, it's not. We just tend to look the other way because we've been told to look the other way and it doesn't matter, which I think is bullshit. I think that's really bad advice. Um, so there's that. We talked about alpha widows. Uh, you know, the, the ability for other guys to imprint on her uh, exists. That's another one of the problems when, you know, she's been the, you know, the village bicycle and, and spent a lot of time with a lot of dudes. Um, women are far more likely to want to be with you over a long-term basis and work through problems. Um, if again, she hasn't been imprinted on by other guys, if she hasn't been alpha widowed, she hasn't been the village bicycle. Um, so contemplate all of those things. So her part, so we covered red flags for family, we covered birth order, we covered alignment, we covered purity, we covered no alpha widows, uh, the imprinting of other guys. Um, so let's talk about the setup now. And the setup is how do you go and have children now and reduce the risk? Okay, let's do that. Let's have that conversation. I'll get to the super chats to see a few more piling in there. Um, how do you reduce the risk? Well, I think you have to reverse engineer it from the point of assuming that a divorce is likely, because it is. A divorce is likely 50% of the time. That also doesn't account for uh, people that stay married, that are unhappy, that are unable to untie the knot because any number of reasons. They don't have the financial resources. They're too ugly to untie the knot and replace the other person with somebody else. Uh, they've completely let, let themselves go. There's any number of reasons why uh, people stay together, you know, for the kids. Um, and it's often because uh, misery ensues or that's a consequence of it, right? It's like, you know, half the people get divorced and then there's a good chunk of the people that stay together that are unhappy. Um, I keep going back to the study, uh, Aaron and Acevedo. I quoted it in my book in one of the chapters. Um, you can go look it up on the internet. It's a well-researched study. Um, after eight years, the participants in the study report that less than 12% are still in love and less than 3% are in a state of bliss. Um, if you're going to have kids with a woman, I think you want to at least operate under the conditions where you really like each other. I mean, does really like each other fall into love? Maybe. I don't know. Um, it's certainly not bliss. Like bliss is like an obsession with one another, right? So the vast majority of people that are together for a long period of time are generally not in a state of bliss. So you have to anticipate a problem may arise out of this. And again, the one thing that you always have to understand is women always reserve the right to change their mind at any given time. The woman that you marry is never the same woman that you divorce. Every guy will tell you this. Every, ask any guy that's been divorced. Is the woman that you married the exact same woman that you got divorced? I want you to go around your office, the lunchroom, your friend circle, uh, DM somebody that you know that's been divorced as we're talking about this right now and just straight up ask them, was the woman that you got divorced from the same woman that you got married to? Women reserve the right to change their mind about you at any given time. Into the future, they may have pined for you, obsessed over you early on, only to find seven to 15 years later, she's just not there anymore. You went through betatization through a thousand concessions. I talk about how to maintain genuine burning desire in the last podcast. So again, that's an important reference point there. Um, the chances of it happening do exist, and I think they're pretty significant. So one of the precautionary steps, if you want to minimize the risk while raising kids of losing your wealth and access to your children, because what's the point in having kids if you don't get to raise them? Serious question. What is the point in having kids if you don't raise them? If you don't have an influence in raising them to adulthood, what's the point? There's no point. You're basically an ATM, and that's how most guys find themselves, right? They find themselves in a situation where Woman unties a knot, whatever reason, who cares? She unties a knot. His wealth is moved to her, 
and continues to move to her on a monthly basis because of how Fine Law operates. And then he sees his kid every other your kids every other weekend uh, or Wednesday night for dinner, you know, something like that. That's the deal that most guys get. So I think it's important to live somewhere where family law doesn't hate men. Okay, let's talk about that. I'm going to use um, the United States as an example in this one. Uh, parents organization report card. So this is what you want. Uh, interactive map. Give me the cookie so this opens. There we go. So I'm sure something like this exists in just about every other Western country out there. There seems to be a push for um, this information to uh, get out. Let me stop page. Let me stop share this one and present this one. Okay, so if you go to, if you just Google NPO, uh, National Parents Organization, Child Support Report Card, you'll get this map. This map is updated on a regular basis, uh, and it tells you, um, and it gives you a grade, state by state, on how the NPO rates that state for friendliness towards fathers. So an A grade, I think one of the best states right now, Let's, I mean, let's take something like Kentucky. So Kentucky gets a A minus grade. Um, there's default shared custody, which is the main thing, I believe. Yeah. Um, results, no presumptive child support transfer payment when parental income and parenting time are both equal. So, for example, in Canada, if you make roughly the same amount of money, there's often still a, a child support transfer payment from one parent to the other, okay? Um, in, in states that, that are getting high grades like AIDS, sorry, A's, not AIDS, A's, um, they're generally default shared custody parenting states. So what that means is you don't have to fight for custody, right? So if 50% of the time um, having a kid and guys, let me say this first of all, okay? Some people will say, well, just don't get married. That doesn't matter because if you live somewhere where common law exists, at some point, could be a year, could be three years, depending on where you live. Check with family law where you live. At some point, even if you don't get married, even if you don't go to a church and have a ceremony and all that stuff, the state still sees you as a married couple and they will deal with your assets and your income and the division of those assets in a matrimonial home and alimony support, child support payments, as if you're married. So do, opting out of marriage isn't a solution. Um, one of the solutions that um, uh, the Tradcon crowd come up with is, well, if we just eliminate uh, no-fault divorce, that doesn't solve anything. That doesn't solve anything. It doesn't remedy any of the issues, okay? It just makes it harder to get divorced. They'll, if there's a will, there's a way. They'll still find a way to untie the knot. If she wants to get away from you, she'll find a way to untie the knot, okay? Um, so taking a look at a map like this and understanding where the best places are for fathers to have kids, I would move there. I'm just being honest with you. You know, you guys ask me this question all the time. How do you minimize the risk of having kids, Rich? I'm giving you the fucking answer. This is one of the main things that you need to be prepared to do. Let's say you live in the States and you look at a map like this and you live somewhere that's hostile towards uh, fathers. Uh, what state is this? Washington, okay, it gets an F grade. You live in Washington, you meet a gal, she wants to have kids, you wanna have kids. You vetted her, good family. Alignment, you're firstborn, she's the lastborn. Uh, she doesn't have any of the red flags. If she has a red flag, she's working on it. Good, she looks like mother stock, but you live in a shithole state that hates fathers. Move, go to a map like this. Let's go to, uh, Let's go to all the A states. And so we're gonna untick all of these. These are your options. These are your options. There you go, boom. Florida, Kentucky, Michigan, and California. The problem with California though, is it might be good for fathers, but it might suck for your bank account. So 
one of the problems that I've uh, seen spoken about before with California is if you've been married for a prescribed period of time, I think it's 10 years, um, somebody can correct me in the comments or if there's a lawyer watching or whatever, but after a certain period of time, it's alimony for life. So it's not even you know for six or seven years or for a certain period of time that's prescribed, it's for life. So you might have you know benefits of a, like strong benefits for fathers in a state like California, but shitty benefits as a husband to maintain her lifestyle. Um, lots and lots of stories about guys in California getting just raked over the coals uh, money-wise and for maintenance payments. Even though it might have a good rating for fathers, it has a shitty rating uh, for getting divorced. Whereas places like Florida and uh, Kentucky have far better ratings. So again, let's say you're in Washington. All, that's, all that stuff is true. You want to get married, have kids. You take a look at this map. You know what? I'm going to relocate to Florida. I'm going to move to Kentucky. Whatever it happens to be, that's something that you're going to have to contemplate. Okay? Um, so there's that. Are you willing to make the move? Are you willing to move somewhere that's friendlier towards fathers? Uh, because that would have a significant impact on the people that have the knot untied. She wants to untie the knot? All right, fine, Becky. It's cool. Uh, well, you know, since we live in Florida, there's uh, default shared parenting, so we don't have to fight over that part. Uh, let's just deal with the assets and split them up. And uh, the state also says that you're owed whatever for maintenance or alimony for this prescribed period of time, shorter period of time than it would be in California, for example. Uh, I don't know why we would want to live in California. The tax rate is ridiculous. Um, there's better states that offer... Uh, greater benefits to fathers at lower tax rates. Again, I think Florida is probably one of the best ones right now out of this map, you know, that I'm looking at. Um, but there you go. So there's that. So that's, so that's part of the setup. Um, we've seen certain characters out there go to exceptional lengths to um, protect their wealth. So I'm um, Somebody's going to have to correct me in the, uh, the, the comments on this, but there was that footballer. I can't remember his name for the life of me right now. Um, married a Spanish soap opera star. She was a few years older than him, sorry. Um, she understood that he had a place in society of significance, of influence and importance, because he's a footballer. He's a winning player on a great team lives in a nice house, drives nice cars, uh, travels on private jets. Only everything wasn't in his name. It was in his mother's name. <laughs> so there's certain preventative steps that can be taken in anticipation uh, of the mother trying to leverage the corrupt family court system because it's not just in the States or Canada or England or in Spain it's in most Western developed countries. There's, there's some level of fuckery that you're going to have to navigate. And I'm not a lawyer. And even a lawyer would not be able to tell you all the bullshit ways that you could get screwed over in all the different countries. So if you live in France or Spain or Germany or somewhere in Europe, for example, um, and you have a question and you want to get married and have kids or you want to have kids and don't even want to get married it doesn't matter right you, you want to have kids and don't even want to get married you should still talk to a family lawyer and ask them hey we live here uh when people untie the knot how does that work right what sort of precautionary steps can i take buy a, an hour of a lawyer's time it shouldn't cost more than four or five hundred bucks it's entirely reasonable yeah a chef hakimi thank you um this dude over here. You can go look it up. There's there's all kinds of uh, press pieces around it where he's talking about um, how how he basically how the ex wife now is surprised that she's not getting anything because nothing was in his name. Now there might be laws where she can turn back the clock on that. Uh, fraudulent conveyance is um, something that is used often here in Canada, um, where. Look, I'm not getting into the legal terms and all that and all those details, but you should talk to a lawyer where you live so that as part of the setup, uh, you've taken the precautionary steps to set yourself up right. You've got the asset set up right. Um, you've done it well in advance of any nuptials. Um, there was a video that I did in the last month. There was a guy from New Zealand, uh, some of you may have seen the video, that 
got involved with a gal that was a uh, roommate in his house. Um, he had a few other re- roommates. She was one of them. They started dating. Uh, he was divorced, by the way, and he ended up getting the matrimonial home as part of divorce. He had to buy out his ex-wife as part of that divorce. So after that was done, uh, he moved some people in to help, I guess, pay the mortgage, let's say. And one of the people that he moved in was a, a gal. He starts dating this gal. They start banging. Uh, she ends up moving into the master suite of the house. The other roommates end up moving out. They end up having kids. Before they start dating, by the way, she tells him, and apparently he was able to present this to the judge, she tells him, I think that you should probably put the house um, in a prenup or some kind of a trust. I can't remember what it was exactly, but uh, take a precautionary step, let's just call it, to ensure that he is the owner of the home should the relationship break down. Uh, so they have two kids. Sure enough, the re- the relationship breaks down. And what did I say earlier? Women always reserve the right to change their mind at any given time. She has she hires a lawyer, and the lawyer manages to get her half the house, even though she told him before they got into a committed relationship that he should protect his assets um, and create. I can't remember what the mechanism was at this time. Let's call it a, a trust or something like that create some sort of barrier to prevent her from um, acquiring the house. And he thought that he did the right thing. And, you know, he thought that it was virtuous of her to encourage him to do that. I'm sure she knew what the fuck she was doing. And she knew that there was a carve out of some sort of loophole. um, And whatever steps were taken were taken. But either way, at the end of the day, this dummy who ended up buying out his first wife from the matrimony home and paid her off so that she could go, ended up having to get another mortgage to pay off the, the new gal that he was dating that was a roommate that he had a couple of kids with um, the house a second time. So he's ended up paying out two women twice out of the same house. The setup is really, really important. I don't think that you should rely on any other anybody's advice other than a lawyer that's licensed to practice family law in your state and has a good deal of experience. I think that it's a good idea to spend money if you want to have kids uh, to understand what you're getting into. And if it doesn't look good, you don't need to tell her, I sat down with a lawyer and it doesn't look good. Just be like, this isn't where I want to live. I like this place better. Let's move here. And then move the family there, right? Because she's in your frame. She's got genuine burning desire for you. You know, she's on your mission. She wants to be a compliment to your life, not the focus. So she'll go along with it, right? Keep in mind, guys, in none of this am I saying fuck the kids because this is where this this video will get like manipulated. Some some psychopath will be like, see, Richard hates children. He doesn't want them to be looked after. At what point did I say that? Of course, a father is going to take care of his kids. OK, of course, I'm encouraging men to take care of their kids. Why wouldn't you? But if the kid needs a thousand dollars a month. And the child support table say you got to pay twelve thousand dollars a month. How is like how does that work out? How does that fucking fare, right? I'm asking guys to ask questions of themselves and set their life up in such a way that it's not going to bankrupt them, create major inconveniences, or allow her to leverage the corrupt family law system to alienate him from his own children, his own DNA, his own name. The whole purpose of him having kids stolen from him because this is common. It is very common and it happens very often. So we talked about lawyers. We talked about where to live. Let's talk about the prenup thing. doesn't matter if you get married or not. If you're going to live in a way that looks like marriage to the state, you're going to need to get a prenup. You, a lawyer may call it a cohabitation agreement, may call it a prenup. doesn't matter what he calls it. You need some kind of an agreement in place because you're planning on having kids, which deals with how you're going to untie the knot, how the relationship will be unfolded, okay? And by the way, you can't contract outside of family law in a prenuptial agreement. So what that means is, if you live in a state that's hostile you know, towards father, so let's say Washington, uh, you're probably gonna get fucked. You, you probably won't see your kids. She'll probably try to alienate you from your kids. If you live in a state like that and you have a lawyer draft up a prenup that says, um, oh, we're going to agree to uh, split custody 50-50. That doesn't trump what family law says. 
if family law in the state says that most moms are getting the kids, or if that's the precedent that's generally set through the corrupt family court system, that's probably what's going to happen. It doesn't matter what the prenup says. It doesn't matter. You can't contract outside of family law. What you can do for children, let me just be specific. What you can do, though, is you can say, well, I brought $5 million to the table. You brought $80,000 and 200 grand worth of student debt to the table. If things untie, I'm going to keep what's mine and you're going to keep what's yours. And as far as the parenting issue, you know, where the kids goes, you're, you're going to have to rely on family law depending on where you live, whatever that state says. So you have to understand that. Okay. So I would still get a prenup. There's, there's a contingent of people out there that says they're not worth the paper they're written on. They're like toilet paper. I've heard lawyers say they're absolutely valuable and they work. Get one. Okay, like talk to the lawyer in the state that you live in or where you live, the province you live in, and specifically ask the lawyer, can we draft something that is going to protect my assets? One. Two, uh, is there anything that we can include in that that will ensure that if we have kids, uh, that there'll be fair and reasonable treatment? So ask him for that sort of advice. Uh, there might be a prenup, there might be a postnup, there might be a cohabitation agreement. He might ask you to restructure your assets in such a way that they can't be touched. Uh, there's any number of things that you can do, right? And sometimes these things will take months, maybe even years for you to do. Like with fraudulent conveyance, it's two years in Ontario. So if I do something today, if within two years somebody feels like they were uh, done wrong by, it doesn't matter what I did today. If it's within two years, I can turn back the clock and uh, open up that contract so it's no longer valid. Um, so there's a lot of legal mechanisms that can get in the way of you getting what you want. So again, if you want to have kids, the whole point of having kids is what? Passing on your name, passing on your DNA, leaving a legacy behind. This is why most guys want to do it. This is why guys ask me this question. You're, you're walking up a slippery slope. So put on all the protective gear and take all the necessary steps and navigate it accordingly. Uh, there's always the guys that'll be like, well, why don't I just get a, uh, what do they call them? A surrogate. Why don't I just hire a woman? Uh, you know, I'll buy an egg and I'll hire a woman and, uh, uh, you know, raise my own kids. I'll get a Filipino nanny or something like that. Okay, fine. You know, that's one way to have 100% control over the thing. But at the end of the day, the best situation for uh, kids tends to be a two-parent household. Mom's involved, dad's involved. Uh, he's taking care of the manly stuff, like, you know, the blue jobs, and she's taking care of the pink jobs. Um, that's the ideal way to go about it. There's, It's not always optimal. You know, we've We've heard stories of, um, like there's lots of stories of women using sperm banks, that, like single mother by choice. They've got the egg, they have the womb. It's very easy for them to get sperm, right? They can they go get it for free, probably. I don't even know if there's a fucking payment mechanism in, in, in place. There's Facebook groups where um, lesbian couples will go on there and be like, hey, I'm ovulating and uh, we need a, a turkey baster full of uh, some guy that's like six foot tall, uh, has uh, blonde hair, blue eye features, and uh, is a licensed professional in some realm of work, right? And uh, we'd like to have your sperm. And these guys will give it away for free. Um, so there's all kinds of other different ways that, that people cook up to have kids, but you wanna have useful kids. Uh, generally speaking, you're gonna wanna have a two-parent household. That's always gonna be the best way to do it. Um, so having good mother stock matters. Um, where are we at? I don't think I'm going to have time for call-ins on today's show because i got to get to the Super Chats too still. So those are the main things. Your part, her part, the setup, and then the execution is really just go back to the last episode that I did on maintaining genuine burning desire because, she ha because a woman's hypergamous nature means that she's got to look at you as her best option. If she's looking at you and you're not her best option, that's when the pool boy looks interesting. That's when Steve from accounting looks interesting. That's when Kevin, the VP of sales, looks interesting to her. If she puts you through betatization through a thousand concessions and you're less attractive to her and other options look more attractive or she ascends a corporate ladder and you don't progress in your life and she's doing better and you're not, there's all these different equations and mechanisms that come into play based on her evolutionary behavior and how she selects a mate, how she wants to keep a mate, whether she wants to mate switch, 
from him to another uh, guy. There's all these mechanisms that come in place. But at the end of the day, if she has a genuine burning desire for you, it's very unlikely that she's going to exercise or even contemplate other options because she wakes up to you, the father of her kids, as a good man that is also good at being a man that she has genuine burning desire for and that she wants to be around on a long-term basis. She wants to take vacations with. She wants to sit at a family event in front of uh, loved ones with the kids running around frolicking with the grandparents. Like That's what a good woman is, right? That's what a woman of, of, of good moral character is. Uh, she's going to have strong, genuine burning desire for you. Make sense? Makes sense. All right. Let's do questions. Let's do this uh, list of super chats because a bunch of stuff came in here. Um, hey, Rich, can you do an episode on how to prepare for an income in global civil war? Oh, my. I mean, I can try, but the YouTube algorithms don't like that content. The, that's, that's a conversation that I have with the guys in my community. So if you're newer to my channel, I have a community. There's different tiers in the community. Um, these are conversations that we have. We talk about stuff like what happens if the shit hits a fan? How do you navigate if the shit hits a fan? How do you prepare for if the shit hits a fan? Um, that's where I have those conversations. We do those privately. So if you want to join a community of guys that win at life and are prepared and have a strong social network, join my community. You can find that by going to my uh, website at richcooper.ca. Um, yeah, I, I'd i love to give you all the stuff that we've talked about and all the details, but um, YouTube doesn't like that kind of content. Uh, Evening Rich, I've DM'd you a video about false accusations. I'd like to go over, do a video podcast episode on the subject at hand. Um, I get a lot of DMs because you're going to have to resend it to me. Resend it to me today and I'll take a look at it and um, it might be worth looking at. Uh, I'm going to go through as many as I can. I got two boys and have dated several good looking women in the past but have been severely betatized by my ex currently chasing excellence and making myself better. Good. Level up. Hello. Uh, am divorced and it took years to get equal access to my kids. Uh, want more kids, but am unwilling to risk another divorce. What are your thoughts on surrogacy? Seems to be a cheaper option than marriage and kids. Cannot be taken away from father. I touched on it briefly. Uh, you know, kids are always better off with a mother in the household. <laughs> if she's a good mother. The problem is, is how do you find that? And if there's low inventory, low availability of mother stock, and all you're running into is um, really bad candidates for mother stock to have more kids, then I don't see a problem with hiring a surrogate. I don't know what you paid them, 20, 30, I don't know, $20,000, $30,000 to have your kid. Um, then you're gonna need a nanny to help you raise them because like, you can't work and raise small children at the same time, it's impossible. It's, it's not like, Children don't have any memories anyway for the first three, four years, really, when they become adults. I mean, my first memory is probably around four, you know, if, you know, if I'm being honest. Um, so having a nanny for the first, like, early years being being helpful and useful. And there's also the notion of, like, schooling. Like, how are you going to school? Are you going to homeschool them? Are you going to put them in the public school system? I mean, I touched on it briefly, but I'll say this. Like, if, you, if you're going to have kids, why would you put them in the public school system? I think it's an incredibly bad idea. I, I just do. Um, the even even the private school systems are not that much better. Um, I remember looking at some private schools, you know, for my kid, and there was one that we went to that had all the signs of like the wokeness in it. There was rainbows, there was flags, uh, you know, transformer flags. Um, inclusivity notions and sound bites all over the place. Um, they're not much better. And again, like the whole point of raising or having kids is to pass on your name and your DNA and leave a legacy. And why would you want them to adopt the matrix mindset? Because that's what it is, right? Like the 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 public school systems, the the marketing, the Hollywood, the Disney f films, the sitcoms. 
uh, music, uh, TikToks, social media, everything out there is trying to turn your sons into weak, compliant pussies and your daughters into whores. Um, so I think if you're going to have kids, one of the things that you should definitely evaluate and be on the same page with the kid's mother is homeschooling and educating them in, in such a way that it's aligned with your personality and your goals and what you want to leave behind them. I mean, like they're your kids. Why wouldn't you want them to have the best? You wouldn't want your kid's mind polluted with ideas that you don't agree with. So I think that's important too. Um, so when it comes to the notion of like a surrogate, sure, uh, you're going to need money. I mean, you're going to pay either way. You're going to pay either way. You're going to pay to support probably the mother of your kids stay home and raise them and turn your house into a home. Or you're going to pay a nanny uh, to help you do the exact same thing and homeschool on terms that you like. There's also, um, you know, I've been made aware of these uh, networks or these homeschooling groups that sort of like, um, they follow a certain protocol. Like a buddy of mine, um, he didn't he didn't have time to raise his kids. And he moved to a part of the world where uh, it was better than woke Westerners or woke Western sort of agendas, but he still didn't like the schooling option. So what he did was, he collaborated with a bunch of other expats and and they set up their own school. Um, and it wasn't big, it was small. It was like, you know, a couple dozen kids, you know, in total. Uh, but the curriculum was all agreed upon by the parents. The parents were out there putting their dent in the universe, uh, you know, making money. Um, the school followed uh, all the boundaries and guidelines that the parents had set out. And if anybody tried to join the school, I found that, you know, this story was interesting too. He said there, there was a couple of times where um, expat parents who were more drunk on the woke Kool-Aid tried to put their kids in the school and they refused them because in the interview process, um, you know, they discovered that they had some beliefs that uh, weren't aligned with the teachings of the school. Um, so there's different ways to do things like that. It's, it's, you have to be very, very deliberate, you know, I think is a point that, you know, we got to make there. Um, Giuseppe says, hypothetical scenario. What if a man is stuck in a marriage where the wife refuses to submit the husband and the wife continuously crosses boundaries and she wants to leave her marriage as soon as possible? Should the man try to fix it or leave? That's tough, especially if you have kids. Um, if you don't have kids, I would leave. It's not even a question. It's like, there's no kids involved, out, done. Like, I'm not going to try. You've probably already tried. Um, if you've got kids involved and you live somewhere that's hostile towards fathers and she's got a bunch of red flags, I would try to find a way to minimize the risk of the knot untying and damaging you severely. Because let's be honest, the knot will probably untie. She'll probably want to get out. She'll find a way to get out. But I would find ways to delay, minimize, or reduce the risk of harm coming to the kids and you uh, because this is a scenario that many guys deal with like there's this is a very very common question I have I have some high net worth guys that are like engineers in the fang companies making lots and lots of money eight nine hundred thousand dollars on an annual basis and they tell me the story on an ongoing basis usually guys that come to the states um, from Asia from Europe or something like that they marry an American woman um, they make in bank like bucks deluxe. And then these chicks are just horrible to deal with. Um, they won't cooperate. They're disagreeable. Uh, they're, they're malicious. They're mean. They're just mean people. And they stick around for the kids and they try to fix shit. And if you can't fix it, I mean, what do they say about the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and, ago, over and over again, expecting a different result. If you get to the point where you find yourself doing the same thing over and over again, and you're not getting a different result, then you're insane for letting it happen. And you have to go through the process of um, acknowledging, owning that, and untying that. 
Uh, Kizza says on Jordan B. Peterson, he failed with his daughter, and now she's a single divorcee mother. Actually, she got married. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's funny because she got married to that guy younger than her. her. I think she's 30-something, and he's 20, 23, 24. She's, he's, he's considerably younger than her, and his name also happens to be Jordan, which I thought that was funny, <laughs> um, who was with Russian communists who came to be in possession by a demon. I mean, whatever. <laughs> I don't... I don't like to spend a lot of time on the Jordan Peterson daughter dynamic because uh, it sucks. Uh, what are your thoughts on sperm donation? Wouldn't it be a good option for a guy seeking bachelor life only? I mean, like I mentioned earlier, there are these Facebook pages that have couples looking for sperm donors. Um, so the vast majority of the time, if you donate sperm, whether it's through a clinic and okay here let me just back up for a second the first problem you have with this is you don't raise the kid all you're doing is scattering seed and if all you want to do is scatter seed okay that's one way to do it you could scatter a lot of lot of seed by donating sperm for sure uh we'll call that the Genghis kong method of uh passing your passing on your dna into perpetuity um he didn't raise any of the kids didn't have an influence on them the vast majority of them were just like either uh, Whatever, I'm not going to get the details. Um, so there's that part of it. So if that's important to you, then it doesn't tick off that box. Now, let's talk about the people that are acquiring sperm. Let's say women. The women that are acquiring your sperm through the donation method. That might seem like a good idea or a way to have kids without even having any obligation to the kids um, or financial, you know, responsibility, but you don't have any authority, you don't have any raise in them, but let's say that that's your thing, you just want to scatter seed. The problem with it that I've seen, and I've seen these Facebook groups uh, where it's, so it's either lesbian couples or it's a uh, male-female couple, like a heterosexual couple, where the guy is so low T, so soyed out that his sperm doesn't have any mobility and she can't get pregnant, they've tried. Um, and they look exactly like you'd think they'd look like. You know, like when you see the social media avatar for the soy boy couple, um, they look exactly like they look like. Look like. They typically vote strongly far left. Uh, they're drunk on the woke Kool-Aid. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the kid that they have, if it was a boy, they would, they would transition them. Um, so the point that I'm making is, do you really want to put your... It's like putting a Ferrari engine in a fucking 30-year-old rusted-out Honda Civic. It's the same thing. Um, yeah, you're putting a Ferrari engine, but it's going into a shitty housing. And that shitty housing is going to be raising your seed for life, 20 years plus, right? So there's that. So I... I'm not about it, but if you want to go Genghis Khan and scatter seed, just know that you're scattering seed in less than ideal uh, parent stock. Uh, hey, Rich, do you think about having uh, much children pe like people did back in the day as a tactic to make it less easy to leave and stay together? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so in Buss's studies uh, from Evo Psych, people tend to stay together when they have more kids. So no kids, higher chance, probability of divorce. One kid, still a high chance. Multiple kids, you have lots of kids. Uh, the probability of divorce goes down. Not to say that it's not going to happen. Um, I talked about this, I think, on a general show, but there's a Mormon fella uh, out there who's popular. He talks about style. I mentioned him in my book, The Unplugged Alpha. Um, his name's Tanner Guzzi. He's a nice guy. I've met him. Um, we don't agree on... The things that I talk about because he's Mormon and he's got seven kids with his second wife now. He's been divorced once. Anyway, his second wife is leaving him uh, pregnant with a seventh child. So it's not a guarantee. It's, you know, it's a probability. I, I guess like George Gammon likes to say, you know, we don't have assurances or guarantees. We have probabilities. The probability of the knot untying is lower if she's got a bunch of your kids, but it still exists clearly as I just, you know, stated. Um, some articles accusing Huberman of plate spinning five women. Also, something about trying to have a baby via IVF. He trying to dodge some law. Thought no, 
Uh, I think the IVF, so I read the article and I tweeted about it the other day. I mean, who cares? Uh, you know, if a chick does it, it, she's fucking strong and brave. If a guy does it, he's uh, a player. You know, he's a, he's got commitment issues or something like Whatever, who fucking cares? Um, so he's a chatty spinning plates, whatever. Um, the story about the IVF that he went through seems to be, for my opinion anyway, that um, the woman that he chose to take seriously at the time was a single mom of two kids. I think he met her when he wasn't that popular, if I understood correctly. And um, they got together and, uh, you know, she's got a couple of kids from the prior relationship. She's older, I think. At the time of the article, she was in her mid-40s, which would place her in her very early 40s, maybe 41 when they met. So the, so the chances of having a kid at 40 or 41 is pretty low. Uh, IVF is commonly used for women at that time. Uh, it sounds like Huberman wants to have kids. The best, His best bet, if I'm being honest, I mean, if he wants my advice on this and he doesn't really fucking need it because he knows these things, is find a younger woman. And find a woman, a younger woman that, rewind this video to the, the start, ticks off all the boxes that I talked about earlier so you can minimize the risk of losing access to your kids and being alienated. So there's that. Um, okay, we're almost done here. There's two more and we'll wrap up. I resent the video, DM, uh, it's from my friend Aiden Pallion, filled to the brim with citations of study. Okay, I'll take a look at it, bud. Um, Giuseppe, Jenny Desire and her picking you as a first choice is paramount. Yeah, 1,000%, 1,000%. But again, she could choose you as her first choice. You could, she could have genuine burning desire. She could do all of the things that I talk about in my book that exhibit GBD. Um, but as Esther Perel has pointed out, in her studies, in her work, she's a psychologist, women's desire for a man tanks quickly over time. So if you had desire on one axis here and time on the other axis, a woman's desire tanks like a hockey stick. A man's, it also goes down, but it's much slower. Um, so you've always got to, you've always got to game a chick on a long-term basis. You can't relax, uh, chill out on your laurels, you know, your accomplishments. Um, there's a major league baseball player that I had at my forum event. Um, I have a video with the interview. I'm going to send it out to my email list very soon. Um, and world class, uh, inducted to the Hall of Fame. Um, an, an athlete with tens of millions of dollars you know, to his name, maybe even more. But when he retires, he sits on the couch, kicks his feet up, wants to take a nap. His wife comes in the room and says, what are you doing? Why are you taking a nap? And he said, look around. All of this is because of my career. I think I can take a nap, right? Women will question you. They will shit test you. Desire will diminish over time. Um, she will, like the standard that you set, the thing you got to understand, the standard that you set in a relationship, in a marriage, on a long-term basis with a chick, she now thinks that this is, you could be fucking Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt got divorced several times. Um, Jeff Bezos got divorced. Uh, y you could be the richest guy in the world and a woman will still untie the knot and divorce you, right? Because women reserve the right to change their mind at any given time. The standard that you set at that level, they're going to think that they can replace you or find somebody that's adequate enough to... Re like, remember, women are hypergamous, right? They want to be with guys that other women want to be with, that other men want to be. They want to be able to look up to a giant. They want to know that you're the best option so she could she could get to a point of delusion where it's like, you know, I've been with this guy Rich and he's awesome and he's got all of his shit together and he's competent and he's influential and he's funny and he's uh, he can solve problems and drives fucking like a bat out of hell in a car, all that sort of stuff. And it's like, she'll just think that there's 100,000 other guys that are, that are just like me after a certain period of time. So you've always got to be game in them, man. You've always got to be, it's going to be work. You want to have kids? It's going to be work. I think I can end up on that note. You want to have children and you want to minimize the risk, it's going to be a shit ton of work. It's going to be a lot more work than your great, 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 great grandfather had to do to keep your great, 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 great grandmother around. Times have a changed. So anyway, <laughs> you guys want the cheat codes to minimizing risk in raising kids? They don't exist. It's dressed in overalls and it looks like work and it's going to require you to do some fucking things that 
uh, your ancestors didn't have to do to minimize the risk. There's laws out there that fucking hate you, that will find a way to destroy you. And if a woman wants to utilize them to her benefit, as I covered in my book, get the damn book if you haven't read it. The Unplugged Alpha is on Amazon. Please leave a great review and let guys know what value you got out of it if you have read it. If women want to leverage those corrupt laws, they will. And it's not that uncommon. Uh, it's generally more common than it is uncommon. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the cast and it provided a little bit of insight and uh, a little bit of uh, you know behind the scenes on this. It's, uh, it's just an interesting dynamic. It's an interesting conversation. I think kids are wonderful. Uh, I think that you should leave kids behind you know, if you want to. Um, but just understand that it is a totally different world. It's a very, 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 very different world. So we'll wrap it up on that note. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, get on my email list. Uh, check out the uh, website. It'll talk about future events, my community, my supplement line. Uh, grab the supplements. I'll probably do a show next week breaking down all the supplements because I haven't had a chance to do that in a while and there's some new shit to talk about as well. Uh, anyway, we'll wrap it up on that note and we'll see you guys uh, soon. Moff's on tomorrow. See you guys later. All Peace right, out. guys. If you enjoyed that podcast, make sure you visit my website at richcooper.ca to learn more about my courses. My <laughs>